Sometimes you've experienced seasons in your life. When you live in Edmonton, you've experienced seasons because you have a different season every six hours. That's kind of what it feels like. Now, I've been to Hawaii a few times. In Hawaii, there is no different season. Uh, I mean, it is literally the same temperature with just a little bit of rain or no bit of rain. But in life, it doesn't matter where you are or where you've been, you're going to find different seasons. And it's just not the physical seasons. There is a season of adolescence. There is the season of seniorhood. We'll call it that. There is this <laughs> the season of being a grandparent. How about this? There's the pregnancy season. You guys, you all with me? Uh, you, how many people remember those seasons? Uh, how many remember the toddler seasons? There's all, some of you guys, it's the single season. Now you are into the marriage season and you into the anniversaries season. There's all these different types of seasons that we have in our life. And some people deal with the financial crunch seasons. Some people deal with the blessings seasons. And so what we've been talking about in growing seasons is when you plant a seed and it goes in the ground. Before it comes up, there's seasons that are happening. And one of the things we talked about is there's a waiting season. Everyone say waiting. We talked about the waiting season. The waiting season, it says to be still, but to be still doesn't mean to stand still, to do nothing. Waiting actually means that you're doing what you've been doing. So if you are flipping hamburgers, you are going to be the best flipping hamburger flipper that you can absolutely be in that waiting season. Now, it may, maybe you've gone to the remembering season. See, because you're, you're struggling before the seed comes out of the ground, you're struggling, and you need that seed, you need to see something, and so we call it the remembering season because you need to remember what God has already done in your past. Because if, when you see what God has done in your past, it helps you for your future. Because you go, oh, 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 yes, 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 the writing on the wall. Remember we talked about tassels and things like that in your life to make traditions, godly traditions. That's another season. Last week, you guys, we talked about the season of promotion, right? When it looks like there's nothing, when it's invisible stage, and that's still under the ground stage. It's like, it feels like a dry season, but it's the season of promotion where that old seed is coming up, and it's going to just blossom as it comes out, whether it's a, a small sprout, a bush, a tree, whatever it is. But you have to get through the invisibility and then the insignificance, and then you got to overcome the intimidation. Because you're worried now because somebody said something to you. But again, you got to go back to the remembering season and remember what God has said about your life. Today, we're going to talk about the season and wrap up the growing seasons with the season of steadfastness. Everyone say steadfastness. Can you say, say steadfastness again? Steadfastness, steadfastness. Can you say it a few times really fast? That, 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 I can't. Here's the thing. If you don't cooperate with the seasons, you're going to get stuck in them. You got to cooperate with the seasons, just like you got to cooperate with your spouse. Otherwise, you're not going to get through that marriage. <laughs> and this, and see, I'd say this for the kids, but they're not here. You got to cooperate with the parents. It's a season, <laughs> but then you get to become the parent one day. Uh, I, I, if you don't cooperate with the seasons, you're going to do something and mess up the process. For example, there was this guy named Mano. You know, and he was in the middle of the summer, and his wife, you know, she's about to take off for work, but she's frustrated. His wife comes along and says, Mano, I have no idea. Why, why are you taking so long? It's just like you sit on your butt all day long. I have no idea what you're doing, but you just like all the other men. You just do nothing. You just sit and sit and sit. Listen, I can't wait till school starts and you start teaching those kids again. You're just sitting all summer. I wish I could do that. Do something with your life. Paint the house. The garage is in samples. And so, you know, Mano's just listening to it. And so she heads out the door. Well, he gets up off his chair. Well, that's it. I don't know what she's talking about. It's just, I'm going to prove to her that men do stuff. So Mano heads out to the paint store. He goes, I'm going to paint the house. So Mano goes out. He gets all the paint. He comes back, and he starts working on everything. Well, his wife comes home, and she sees half the house painted. She's like, oh, this man actually getting good. I like this man, Mano. And so she comes around the back of the house. She sees Mano, and he's, he's laying on the grass, and he's, like, exasperated. It looks like he's dehydrated, half out of it, with a coat on. And she goes, Mano, honey, what you doing? And he looks up at her and goes, what do you think? What do you think of the house? 
what you think of the house. I, I, I painting the house. And she looks at him. She goes, but Mano, why are you wearing two jackets? You're going to die out here in the scorching hot weather. Mano looks at her and goes, well, I read the instructions. And the instructions say, wear two coats. But you got to know your season. <laughs> you got to know what season you're in. And I'm telling you, if you have not gone through the season of steadfastness, you will, or you have, or you're going to go through it again. Because these seasons repeat their cycle. Different things at different times in your house. You're going to go through this in your life. I remember it was quite a few years ago, I got a call from one of my staff, and it was on a weekend. And I was kind of concerned. They just said, listen, Evan, you have got to get into work here. So our leader has just up and left us. Like he, he literally had just looked and says, I'm tired of this. I can't take this no more. And he just walked out. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, you, like did something happen? Did somebody get mad at him? He's like, no, 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 nothing. I have no idea what's going on. So I decided to head over to the house because I was quite worried. Like, is he gone? Did, did he get hurt? Uh, you know, did his wife leave him? What had happened? So once I got over to the house, you know, I knocked on the front door. There was no response. I went around the back, and I checked the back door. I knocked again. There was still no response, but it sounded like a TV was on. So when I knocked, I tried the door, and the door opened. And so I went in. And as I looked in, I could see him sitting in his easy chair watching his TV. And I yelled his name over to him. I said, hey, hey, it's Evan. Can I come in? And he just kind of let a hmm, hmm, didn't really say much. And I sat down, and it took a little while to start the conversation. And you know what I realized? He had had no moral failure. Nothing was wrong physically in his life. None of those things. I asked him, what is wrong? And he says, I'm just tired of doing the same thing day in and day out. I just can't take it anymore. I just can't take it. You know, sometimes we just think when there's these big challenges in front of us, those are the days that we can't take it. But actually, more often than not, it's actually when you got to do the same that you've done day after day after day, and you've been believing by faith day after day after day, but nothing is changing. Those are the days that are more of a challenge to most of us than the days that are the same. To be steadfast. See, the excitement of the early days had left him. He was used to having crisis, solving conflicts. He had done an incredibly good job with all the staff all the people he worked with. He'd had some great successes over the 10 years. But as I was kind of reflecting back with this message about this gentleman that I remember very well, I really look back and I just say, really, the test of a challenge is not our biggest issue. It's the absence of the challenge. It's when you have an absence of that challenge in your life. And it's a, ste a season of steadfastness. Uh, you know, you, you, nothing's happening. It's not our biggest and issue. And it's probably one of the most frustrating times in your life. When you see a tree and it has something on it, the fruit's there, but it's not quite ready to eat. And you see it, and it's just taking longer and longer and longer. And you're, you're struggling. You're trying to wait. But see, this problem is it's not about waiting. It's just about being steady. It's doing what you're doing. Continue to nurture. Continue to feed. But we have an enemy who is trying to distract you from being steady. I want you to work with me here in Hebrews 10 and in verse 36. I want you to read this with me. You ready? Go. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Wow. Wow. It says, for you have the need of endurance, the season of steadfastness. You need, so some people think endurance is about getting through the conflict. But I'm going to tell you, conflict only lasts for a short period of time. You can't be at 100 miles an hour for a long time. Endurance is a long race. You're not sprinting. When I did the 400 meter, I remember when I was young, I was a 100 meter track runner. And they put me in the 400 and I... I took out of the starting blocks, man. I went around so fast. I look back. They were 20, 30 feet back. I got halfway, 200 meters. I look back. They're two feet. I get 300 meters. I look behind me. There's nobody. They get to the end. I'm by myself because I didn't have endurance. 
I sprinted. Life is not a sprint. Life is about endurance in your life. And it says to do, see, it says so that when you have done the will of God, here's the thing, you're doing the will of God in your whole life from here to here. And as you're going through and doing the will of God in your life, you're going to miss out on the promise because you don't have endurance now to receive what God's giving you. Someone else is going to get that tree of fruit, not you. Someone else is going to reap your harvest. And so you need to have endurance in your life. This is when people drop out of the race. This is when people drop out of marriages. This is when people drop out of jobs. How many people have seen people? There's a, there's a new term now. I just found this out recently. It's called ghosting. People who come to a job and they quickly are gone. And the ghosting is about endurance. There's no patience. There's no waiting. There's no faithfulness. There's no loyalty. It's just ghosting. I'm in and I'm out. People are like that with church. I'm ghosting. I'm in and I'm out. Well, you know that pastor, did you hear he was talking about how people come in and out of church? So I'm out of church. Okay, don't let the door hurt you on the way out. Like seriously, come on. We need to grow up. The problem is, is we're not growing up. We need to grow up. And part of growing up is learning the season of steadiness in your life. I'll tell you the marriages that last are marriages that understand the steadiness. Now, we're going to talk about things you do in the season of steadiness in a little while. But I'm, I, this is what I believe. This is just, ev, we'll call it an evism today. I don't have a, a slide for you on this one. But my evism is, I believe the reason people like conflict and stress more than they realize is because the dopamine and cortisol levels are going into their brain, and they are addicted to stress, and they are addicted to conflict in their life. They don't even know they're addicted, and they absolutely love this rush. They don't know it, but they are. That's the problem. They've become an addict to it. So what happens? What happens in your life when there's nothing left and you're just going through it? You just start dropping out. But God is looking for endurance in your life. He needs endurance in your life and in my life if he's going to see the promises come into our life, if we're going to experience it. It's a growing season, and even though it looks like nothing is changing, See, something's happening. You see the fruit, but nothing's happening at this time. It just looks like a nice tree, and it's just pretty. But what's happening is there's certain qualities God is putting into your life and into your life and into your life. Those qualities that God is building is preparing you and setting you up for that season of fruitfulness, that season that you've been looking forward to so bad. You're looking forward to it so bad, but you just can't remain steady and you drop out one block too early, and you miss your destination. Loyalty, faithfulness, long-suffering, patience. Doesn't mean that nothing's happening in your life. Some people go, well, there's nothing happening in my life. I'm just tired of tired, and I can't do it. And just like this friend of mine who worked with me, he just felt like life was over. You think nothing is happening. I, I, how many people, you've been on, I've asked this before, but how, you've been on a plane, right? You've been on a 737, 747, Airbus, whatever you call them. You've been, I, I, my youngest, Davina, she, she's always interesting when she talks about planes because one of the things she gets on a plane, she gets on, we haven't even left the tarmac yet, and she's like, this is really boring, Dad. So we always brought a big bag of things for her to do, but she got through it in five minutes. So she likes to lift off, and then when we're up there, and I remember this very distinctly one time, she was on the other side of the chairs, her and her sisters, and my wife and I were on the other side, and she leaned over, and she goes, it looks like nothing's going on. Nothing's happening. And, I, and I've heard other people say that on planes. It's just like nothing's happening on here. It's just like this is boring. Nothing's happening? Go open the door. Where'd that brother go? 650 miles an hour that plane is going. It looks like nothing, but it's something. There's something going on in your life. You're like, there's nothing going on. Yeah, open the door, step out, and see God is moving. The trees are growing. The seeds have been planted. They're being nurtured. <laughs> Woo, where Peter go? Where Melu go? Where Stephen go? Like, we have no idea because if they've been steady when they continue and you hit your destination, you go, that was one hour and I crossed this side of the province. From one side of the province to the other. Four hours and I go from one side of the country to the other side of the country. Twelve hours and I'm in a different continent. 
You think nothing's happening? There's a lot happening, but it might be boring. That's a season of steadfastness in your life. A while back, we did uh, the Spartan race. It was about four or five years ago. My wife and I and a few of us and our family, we got out for the Spartan race, and we, we talked about doing, most of us wanted to do it as a team. And at that point, you know, I, I had not been exercising like I previously had been, and, but I had done some preparation, and coaches teach you this. They teach you to prepare. So if you're an athlete, you're preparing. And in this Spartan race, we, because you're doing it as a team, you're all excited. You're all pumped up. I remember we got our black makeup on down, or at least I did, and then I got my bandana, got your Spartan shirt on. I mean, we were going to rock this joint. We were going to take out these hundreds and hundreds of people. Well, Luke took off. He was gone. He wasn't a part of our team. He just wanted to compete. Well, we chose to be a team. And the team it was, we were raw, 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 raw. And we, we, we were having a blast until we hit the first wall you got to climb over. I have to help three people climb over a wall, boost them all up, and I, I'm having a good old jolly time, and I get them up over, and they're all, yay, and they're running off. And now I go to climb the wall. I'm a little exhausted because I've used some of my energy on them. But I get over that wall, and I'm like, yeah, and they're like, come on, come on. They're only like 10 feet ahead of me still. But anyway, so they start running, and we get up, and we're like, whoa, we're getting tired. We get to the next obstacle. You have to walk over a balance. If you fall off, I don't remember how many, but it was like 20 burpees. Do you know what a burpee is? Yeah, everyone hates burpees, especially when you're in a race. And so I had to get down and do 20 burpees because I fell off. I was a little exhausted. A bunch of other people fell off. They were exhausted. Well, they did three, four burpees, pretended they had done them all, and they kept running. I'm trying to do all of them. I'm seeing they're getting way ahead, and I'm like, they need my help. Well, actually, I need help. And then we realized there's 75% more of a race, and I am dead tired. See, it's steadiness. The season of steadiness, we needed to pace ourselves, and I should have had someone extra helping me because me helping three people just really wore me down really quick. You need to preserve your energy for the long haul in your life. And so I believe you got to get back to the basics during the season of steadiness in your life, and that, that steadiness will build the character qualities that you're going to be able to need. For example, patience. You learned it as a parent. You didn't maybe ask to learn it as a parent, but you learned it. You had no choice but to learn patience. And it's a quality of endurance in your life that later on helps you in your job, helps you in your future relationships, your friendships. It helps you in your ministry in church when you have that new character quality of walking through the seasons. And it's during that season that that transferable character goes over to every part of your life. Every part of your life, just allowing God to work the course of your life. So this kind of brings us to our opening thought today I want to share. The greatest test is not challenge. It's often the absence of it. Would you agree with me? It's not challenge. You guys have all faced challenges. You may not like them, but that's not your greatest challenge. The greatest test you're going to go through is the absence of actually challenges in your life because you're going to feel like something's not happening. There's something wrong in your ministry. There's something wrong in your finances. Just nothing is happening. And God is saying, I am building loyalty. I am building faithfulness. I am trying to make you a steady man. I'm trying to make you a steady woman of God. Let's listen to wisdom now in James. Let's take a look in James 1, 2, and 4. He says, consider it. Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, facing trials of many kinds, we automatically assume the trial is always something like a high crisis moment because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance, endurance, that moment of your life. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want you to look at the application that you can take on this scripture oh, that the season of steadiness will produce perseverance. The testing, the trial you're going to go through might be a steady time in your life when you just stay to the wheel. You don't pull over. You continue. You keep driving because you're not at your destination yet. Everyone say that with me. I'm not at my destination yet. And one more time. I'm not at my destination yet. You guys got that? Yet. 
You are arriving. You are coming. You can't see it, but can you hear it? It's coming. You're going to have to run in front of it. And so perseverance will finish its work. You know, I, I was at, I've been asked this question, you know, who is one of the greatest influences in your life? Who is someone that's really impacted you? And often people are looking for, you know, a great author. You know, so I say, well, actually, it was a man named Henry. And they're like, oh, what book did he write? Well, he didn't, he didn't write any books. Oh, oh, oh what, what, what album did he play? Like, was he with one of the bands? Was he with the Beatles? Who was he with? No, nobody like that. Oh, was he, was he a really good politician? He changed things in your county? No, no, nothing like that. Okay, dude, what did he do? Well, actually, he didn't do any of those things. In fact, not many people knew who he was. So here's the thing. This man, Henry, he was hardworking. He was a proud man. He was steady, as steady can be. You know, he carried a lot of jobs in his life. Mostly he liked mechanics. Man, he liked fixing things around the yard, working, just fiddling around with different stuff, but always still liked to play on the cars. And what really struck me in my early life about this man, Henry, was his humble heart and his steadiness. It was so genuine. It was so inspiring as a really young man. Henry was my grandfather. A wonderful man. Just a wonderful man. And I, I, one of the things that I believe is that sediment can expand to everything in our lives as we look at the life of my grandfather, Henry. In the beginning of ministry, your job, your marriage, it seems fun and exciting. But can you be like him? Can you stay steady? Through all the problems, all the things that are happening, can you just stay steady? Can you just say steady? Do you know what I'm saying? It, it, you need to turn your season into steadiness if it's not steady right now. People grow old. They never really encounter a season of steadiness, and they wonder why they don't see the promise. You're not going to see the promise until you can get that season steady of steadiness in your life. Interesting. I remember the one time my grandfather, one thing that I wanted to learn from all his years of experience, he was quite a bit older than I when I was a young man. Uh, but he tried hard. He couldn't swim, but he took me out in the water, even though he couldn't. He made sure he had his life jacket on, all those things, but he couldn't swim. He was fearful of it, but he did those things because he wanted to show me experiences I had never experienced. He took me to different places, did whatever he could to impact my life. And I wanted to learn from him, and I remember I asked him one time, uh, specifically, I, and I said, Grandpa, is there anything that you could give me for advice? I'm, I'm just young right now, but anything in life, because I just saw some different people recently that I really admired in, in athletics. And, and I wanted to know how, how they got to where they were. And I thought my grandpa would be a great role model, could tell me. And my grandfather, you know, was, he, he was just the guy that would remain steady in his life. And, and he says, stick with your wife. Stick with your wife. It's like, stick with my wife? Grandpa, I'm not married. <laughs> Yes, you'll understand one day. Stick with your wife. What is he talking about? But I understand now. I understand that he was talking about the depth of a character quality in my life that I need to have. So now, this year we're celebrating in just a month our 29th anniversary, Mary Lou and I. And we're super excited 29 years later. Grandpa, I have stick with my wife. A season of steadiness. We, we, we don't feel like it's just steadiness, but uh, if you ask each one of us, it's steady, it's steady, it's steady. We have a lot of enjoyment in the meantime. We have new journeys and experiences, but we're not trying to ride it like a roller coaster every day because you can't handle those seasons on an ongoing basis. So here's the thing. I stuck with my wife. You need to run your course. You need to plant your roots. You need to get them down deep, and you need to pace yourself. you got to pace yourself. When nothing's happening, don't be distracted. Don't be distracted by the small things. Focus on the basics. And so I'm going to give you some quick basics today. i got four basics. During the season of steadiness, first basic, your personal relationship with God. Get back to your personal relationship with God. See, in the crisis, you forget about it. But it's going to be tested in the crisis. It's going to be tested when the storms come. Your personal relationship with Christ is going to make a difference. 
It's really easy when you're steadfast to have that relationship with him. So take advantage of that season. Get close to him. If you have a friend in your life, the only way you get closer to him is by spending time with him. You need to spend time with him during that time. Make it tight. Make your, see, here's the thing. People don't know how much they need Jesus till when they're alone with him and they recognize now how much they need him. When everybody's out of your life, that's when people go, I need Jesus. I need God. I need the Lord to help me in my life. And the reason is, is because all the busyness is gone and the steadiness has returned. And you recognize that is Jesus just enough? And that's my question. Is Jesus still enough? If he's not enough, we got to reprioritize. We got to reprioritize our life. There's times that God's working on your character, in your character in your life, and he's going to work on your identity because your identity is probably intertwined. When you lose your job, does it affect your identity? When you lose your ministry, does it affect your identity? When you lose your spouse or a, a tight relationship, a good friend, does it affect your identity? It's because it's just not Jesus and us. When our relationship with Jesus is so strong, we're not identifying our ministry, our job, our relationships with our identity because our identity is in him and him alone. That's when you're going to grow. Sometimes we just don't realize it until that he's all we got. Let's take a look. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. He says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by... His craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. Your minds led astray from what? From the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. Your devotion to Christ is what he's talking about. Your minds will be led astray, and it will pull you from that. And that's what a challenging, a test, a stressful testing in your life will impact. God wants our devotion to be pure and for us to devote it and make it simple. Otherwise, we're going to see troubles in our life. So let's take a look at the second thing, not just a personal relationship basic, but the second one, personal life decisions. It's another basic in your life that's going to make a difference. You're going to have personal life disciplines. Personal life disciplines in your life, what are they? What are the life disciplines that you're going to need? If you actually look at uh, great musicians, athletes, actors, People who are successful at running businesses, they do what they do over and over and over again. They constantly keep doing them back and forth. So, for example, there was a hockey player, one of the strongest hockey players when it came to having a good center of gravity with his legs. Strong legs. You know what he was taught from an early age? I don't know if it was 10 or 12. He started doing 100 squats a day every single day of his life. And then he started adding weight. Because his dad says you need strong legs to play hockey. He was a career. This, this guy's in the Hockey Hall of Fame soon. His name is Yarmar Yager. An incredible player that played for so many years and only got the amount of years because of the strength he had in his body. Because he honed in. Because he honed in. He had personal disciplines in his life. See, the thing is, is sometimes we, we don't discipline ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4 16 and 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Do not lose heart. In your season of steadfastness, Steadfastness. <laughs> Steadfastness. Do not lose heart. It's a light affliction in your life, but it's producing for you an, an eternal reward, an eternal weight. Problem is, God can't trust you with much unless He can trust you with little. Can He trust you with that little bit of that season of steadiness in your life? Can He? Personal life disciplines. Are you going to find a way to get them in place? Let's look at a few just really quick. Just in your own notes. I'm not putting this on the screen. I'm going to go through really quickly. How about daily devotions in your life? Devotion is really all about being devoted, isn't it? It's really being ardently devoted 
to a cause, and, and your devotion is nothing but that, just like those athletes. It's being devoted. Can you be devoted to him? Some people are devoted to promotions. They're devoted to money, possessions. Even some people are devoted to their ministry that they hurt their families and their friends and everybody around them. But the one day when it's all stripped away, you're going to see what your life looks like. You're going to see what your legacy is. Your devotion first needs to be to him. It's really what Jesus says is what matters. Now, here's another one. Not just daily devotion to him, but how about exercise and diet? A personal discipline in life. It's really true. Now, I know some of you go, that's, that's so carnal, Evan. Just carnal. That's all worldly. What are you talking about? Exercise and diet. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you need to represent it well. We have a responsibility, and I am tired of people who are Christians saying, I have no responsibility to my body, but I have responsibility for everything else in life. And what are you, picking and choosing what you're going to use? You need to take care of yourself because you are representing the king of the universe. And when you're representing the king of the universe, it makes a difference. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, people going all weird. Like, people have different sizes, right? We have Big size, medium size, large size. We have little bone, medium bone, big bone, bone heads. You know, we got everything. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm not talking about, you know, don't go do something crazy and, and start on tree bark or something like that. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, you don't need to be Mr. America and be a nuclear gecko. Uh, you, don't, <laughs> you don't need to, you know, be that woman who puts on the red ruby lipstick so thick that it's falling off and cracking. We're not talking about that. We're talking about taking care of yourself. But what about rest moments? Here's another discipline. Rest moments in your life. God's constantly been after me for my rest moments. It's just like rest moments. Oh, my gosh. It's about resting and just taking time to get away. See, it's not about a long time. It's about a short time still. But if God does this, why don't I do it? I, I really, is it just because I really don't think God is going to take care of things while I'm away? Is it really because that if I make a mistake, it's going to cost everybody their life? Like, really, why can't I take a rest moment? Is it because I don't trust God enough to take care of things for me? I need to refresh my soul. And just contrary to what people think, truly, you need a rest period. God designed your bodies for rest period. And that's why he talks about resting on the Sabbath. Here's another one. Personal management. So the personal relationship with God, personal disciplines. But what about personal management? You could call this your personal stewardship in your life. This is something you grow in the season of steadiness. So let's talk first about an area of personal management. What about finances? You know, the way we manage our finances is kind of like a boot camp of how we're going to manage God's true riches. If you can't manage your own finances, you're going to struggle to manage God's finances. Now, here, I, I, you can hashtag this one. It's not how much we have, but how well we manage. It's not how much you have. It's how much you manage what you do have. And that is what God wants us to do. Manage what we have well. You're faithful with the little. God can, then can entrust you with much. You got to manage it. You got to steward it. That's what we're called to do. You know, it might mean you got to look at your checkbook. You know, you just need to find your checkbook. Yeah, some of you just need to find the checkbook. Where'd you leave it? You know, you can't find the checkbook. And then you got to get in it. And then you got to start going through and pulling out. I know it's time, but just pull that book out. Make sure you're managing it well. Even if it's a small discipline in your life, just manage that piece well. Keep your record straight. Another personal discipline orderliness. Everyone say orderliness. So one thing that I learned a long time ago, if you're going to increase your capacity, you should start now. So this guy talked about cleaning out your cars. I wish my wife had not been there for that message. She started telling me, Evan, take the garbage out of your car. Now, I know some of you, you're like me. Orderly, The garbage forgets to come out of your car, but then it forgets the next day and the next day and the next day. And after a while, you're like, I got to clean out my car. Or you're ready to sell it. Now you're going to clean it out. So now you spend $300 to clean it all out so that you can make an extra $400 on it. Because otherwise they're not. You guys got my point, right? It's working on those things. And so one of the things that we ended up changing in our room, my wife says, okay, listen, Evan, I learned this. Your bedroom looks 75% cleaner if you just make your bed in the morning. And I was like, really? 
that's so good because my clothes are not made, you know, whether I throw them here, throw them there. So I'll make my bed at least. So I make my bed, and it looks 75% cleaner. And some of you are like, well, I'm not very good at making a bed. Just pull the sheets up. Just pull the sheets up. That's all you need to do. It's not very hard. Just remember, who are you presenting? The way we dress, the way we dress orderliness, because we're representing the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We, and you're like, really? Dress codes are made for large organizations. It doesn't, you don't have to be business attire, but you got to look good. You got to look the part. Now, again, I'm not talking about going overboard like I was talking about the ruby red lipstick. You don't need to go overboard, but represent well. Just represent well. And here's the last one on this area of personal stewardship and management is planning. You need to plan. Some people have no idea where they're going. I'm like, are you serious? You have no idea? I ask, where are you going for holidays? I have no idea where I'm going. And then they come back and they go, oh, my gosh, we use so much money. Well, that's because you didn't plan your holiday. Listen, dude, I got a 35% discount on my holiday because I planned it and I booked early. Try going to Calgary during the stampede without planning. Good luck. You're walking into the city, driving into the city, and you're driving out because there's no place for you to put your head if you didn't plan. Now, people go, ah, no, no, bro, you know, the Holy Ghost is like a wind, man. You know, I'm just going to move like the wind. You know, I go, no, 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 God plans, bro. God plans. Before the foundation of the world, God planned for the cross and salvation. Before the beginning, he knew the plans that he had for you. He knows how many hairs are in your head. And some of you, he knows how many hairs are trying to grow into your head. He knows all those things because he planned. Planning is a part of God. God plans in advance. You're going, yeah, but you got to move. you got to move, you know. Yeah, you move. You, you move the way you move. Good luck. You're going to struggle. Develop a little bit of planning in your life, and you're going to see God move much better. See, here's the great thing. You're like, well, maybe the God's not in that plan I made. Exactly. And then God will speak to you, and you'll change the plan but at least you planned, and God rewards that plan. There's a difference. God's saying, look out in advance. And I'll tell you, you're going to see a lot of pitfalls are going to be avoided because of it. The last one is personal relationships. It's about personal relationships. So the personal relationship with God, we're talking about your disciplines, we're talking about your management, but also your personal relationships. In your relationships, are you genuine with others? Are you, you, you know, how about those people, they walk into church and they go, Hey, brother, hey. And you look back, oh, I hate his guts. They say, hey, sister, <laughs> oh, she ugly. People do this all the time. You're lying, but they do it. They do it all the time, and they're not authentic. And we have a value in our church at Elevate. And we say that authentic relationships will be a value. And if they are, that means that we're open and we're honest in our life. We're genuine. Why fake it? Why? We only have so much time on this planet. So why are we faking it to make it? There's no need to fake it. Let's change our attitude. Change our situation. See, here's a couple things you need to do if you're struggling with people. Number one, you need to completely forgive. Just completely forgive. And you need to refuse to slander or gossip. And you need to support the person even that you need to forgive. You say, support them. Why should I support them? Because this is what your season, you have time, because you're in a season of steadfastness. It's not like life's rushing by and you got no time to deal with this. Take advantage of your season of steadfastness, that steady season, and take the time to work and support that person. You ever see a person who doesn't like you? I had a bully at school. You know what that bully did? He walked right up, smacked me backside the head. He'd say, hey, how you doing, rum rag? I'm like, good. <laughs> Don't hit me, please. Oh, I'll hit you if I want. Oh, man. And I remember one day. Now, now you guys, th this do not do this at home. Do not do this at home. I said to him, listen, Teddy, why are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I just used his name. So if he sees this live stream. Okay. So I said to Teddy one day, I said, Teddy, you don't like me, do you? What? Psh, me to say that. And he was a big guy. He was three grades ahead, supposedly. In other words, he failed three grades. And I was just like, well, you've been hitting me a lot. Well, I like to hit you. Oh, and I, I, was, and I looked at him and I said, Teddy, Teddy, 
if you want to hit me, hit me right in the face. And he, no lie, he took his fist and he just. <laughs> and I went down. I, I never went down in my life. I'd get hit a lot. I never, I went to the ground. I got up just like a prize boxer, except I couldn't box. And I got back up and I said, Teddy, are you done? And his eyes went wide. He never touched me again. Never again. Two hours later that same day, I went up and I talked to Teddy like nothing had ever happened because I knew something was wrong. And I had a little bit of a background, and I knew his family, there was a lot of struggles. He had a lot of issues with his security in his life. And it was his way of showing he was better and tougher than everybody else. Completely forgive. Don't slander people. Support them. And, or schedule a time to talk to the person. Just schedule a time. If you can't do it quickly, and you do have, you, you have time to, it's in a quick mode, then completely just forgive and move on. Support them. But if you got time, schedule to time to talk to people. Work through the issue of reconciliation. You are called with the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile us back to God. You have the ability inside of you, no matter what your personality is. Here's the key. When you try to reconcile, you're like, they don't want it. It doesn't matter because now you can be at peace with yourself because you've done all you can to make peace with them. And that's what God wants. Let's pray. God, as we go through a season of steadfastness, Lord, there's a lot of things that we need to put into practice that we need to learn so that we can really see the promises. We need to focus on our relationship with you, Lord. We know we got to prioritize our life disciplines, steward ourselves well, keep our relationships restored and genuine. God, it might save our marriage. This could save our family, our future. It could save our ministry. If we will just walk through a season of steadfastness. Lord, in this season of steadfastness, we pray that you would develop the character qualities that need to be built in our life. Help us to stay steady. What we need is not a cheering section. We don't need something new and novel, Lord. Instead, we just need obedience to you to go in that same direction that we can have endurance. And then our roots will go deep and we'll be able to be supported and Stay equipped steady. enough for every relationship, well, we job, and section. ministry. We in don't our need life. something new every and novel, Lord. That we Instead, do and put we our just need to. obedience to you. God, thank you for this wonderful family called Elevate. Help us at Elevate to teach us what you've taught us to walk through this growing season of steadfastness. Give us the strength that we need. If you're here today and you're just like, you know, it's been a steady season, just reach your hand out to God and say, God, I'm with you. I'm jumping aboard your plane. And while it looks like nothing is going on, God, we are going 450 miles an hour. And once that door opens, God, it's a whole new world. Lord, I just pray that you would give people the strength to last and be steady through this period of time. And we thank you, Lord. If you're here and we talked about the relationship with God, I'm just going to say a prayer, and if that's you here, I'm just going to say they agree with me in your heart, and God will change your life. Father, when it comes to a relationship, the truth is it's me and my job, it's me and my money, it's me and my family, it's me and everything else, my ministry, but it's not me and you. Today, I pray that it will be me and you. Forgive me for not making it about you and me. Thank you for forgiving me even though I didn't deserve it. I ask for your forgiveness. And I pray today, God, that I would follow you with everything in my heart to lead my life. In Jesus' name.